Hello students, in this video we'll discuss the mathematical definition of Brownian motion. A stochastic process B of t, where t is on the half line, so it's a continuum of random variables, so it's a continuous stochastic process. We think of t here as time, is called Brownian motion, I'll say standard Brownian motion, If, a couple things are true, if condition one is that for t, for any partition, for any t1 less than t2 less than t3 less than dot 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 tn, the increments b t2 minus b t1 one, all the way down to b t n minus b t n minus one are independent. So Brownian motion has independent increments two for any s and t greater than or equal to zero. B t plus s minus b s. This difference over here, this increment over here, is normally distributed with mean zero and variance t. That's the variance there, right? Okay, so that's variance. All right, and this says that the increments are stationary. Increments are stationary. Okay, so it's stationary increments. Great. Three. Three is that almost surely the map that goes from T into BT is almost surely continuous. Okay. And now I'm going to say this is standard Brownian motion as one more condition that we need to meet. And that condition we need to meet, I'll call it condition four. Condition four is that b of zero is equal to zero. Okay? So this is what Brownian motion is defined as abstractly. Now, with this definition, we have no idea that such a process even exists, and we'll have to construct one of these, and we'll proceed by using the Norbert, constru the Norbert Wiener construction in further videos. Okay. And so now, of course, this is beautiful. And so, of course, from these things over here, we get a couple of different observations. So there's an equivalent formulation. So note that there's an equivalent formulation. Equivalently, equivalently, you can replace condition one with condition one prime, which says that the finite dimensional distributions are multivariable normal. The finite dimensional distributions. are multivariable normal. Okay? That will basically match up with condition one and condition two over here. So condition one and condition two will give me this condition one prime. Two. The expected value of B of T is equal to zero. That's what we need over here. And moreover, the covariance of B T Bs and Bt has to be the minimum of S and T. And then condition 3 is just the same as condition 3. And 3 prime is equal to condition 3, that the paths are almost surely continuous. Okay, so in other words, this is an alternative definition. Of course, we can sort of see why this has to be true, because we know that whatever the smaller one of them is, if you do, if, since, the, since the expected value is zero, you can sort of check this, easily we'll check that further along the way. But let's do a couple different things, and we're going to use, primarily we're going to use one prime and two prime in the construction process, and we'll always reference one, two, and three in actually proving properties. So here's the first property, so here's a proposition. This is called the translation variance, and later we'll prove the Markov property of these things. Translation variance. Okay? And that says, for any s greater than 0, if s greater than 0, 
the process. b of t plus s minus b of s, t greater than or equal to zero, is also standard Brown, is standard Brown emotion. If the process bt is standard Brownian motion, okay. Okay, the proof of this is trivial, right? Because what's going to happen over here? So I know I have to check a couple different things. I have to check that the increments are independent over here. So in other words, are the increments of this thing going to be independent? Well, what we're going to do is if we have if we shift b of t by s, we know that if we shift by s, if I, if I simply just shift by s. If s is greater than zero, then t1 plus s less than t2 plus s less than less than tn plus s, tn plus s. And if t1 is greater than zero, this is bigger than s, right? Bigger than s. So of course, if I shift all these things over here, then I'm going to also, by, by sh simply shifting the incrementation definition, I get the same thing for free. So I get condition one is trivial. So one is checked off. And what about condition two? Condition two, well, of course, I know that no matter where I am, the increments are stationary, so stationarity is, is preserved. Stationarity is not affected. Stationarity unchanged. And then shifts of continuous paths, if you take a continuous path and shift it, it's still continuous, right? So, condition, so shifts of continuous paths, still continuous, almost surely. Great. Okie doke. And now what's the next? And, so, and of course, uh, if you start at zero, if I plug in t equals zero to this at b of s minus b of s, that's, that's definitely zero. Okay, excellent. Let's do the next proposition. The next proposition is the scale invariance prop. And this is scale invariance. And the scale invariance is going to help us understand a lot of the differential structure of this Brownian motion or the lack thereof, right? So the scale invariance says that if a lambda is greater than zero and bt is standard Brownian motion, then so is the process 1 over lambda b of lambda squared t, where t is greater than or equal to 0, right? Again, let's check the conditions over here, though the conditions are going to be easy to verify, right? Because all you need to do is if t1 less than t2 less than t3 less than tn, then the same thing is true of lambda of t1, lambda squared t1, lambda squared t2, lambda squared t3. It's in the same ordering if lambda, because lambda squared is greater than or equal to 0. So in other words, the independent increments is preserved by this. And then next, we have to check that it's normal. So that's the only thing that's difficult to check. So the stationarity is going to, the stationarity is going to be obvious. We just have to check that the variances of the right form, right? Clearly, the mean of these things is still going to be 0, right? Because for any, for any time, I know that b has expected value 0. So it doesn't matter if I scale it by lambda squared, it's still going to mean 0. Now let's just check what the variance is going to be. So the, that's the last component of the proof of this. So what's the variance of 1 over lambda b of lambda squared t minus 1 over lambda b of lambda squared s? Like so, right? So if I look at one, any one of those increments over there, variance, of course, I can pull out a 1 over lambda squared from that. Then to the variance of b of lambda squared t minus b of lambda squared s. And now since it's standard Brownian motion, this is 1 over lambda squared. And then what? And then um, the variance of this thing over here is just going to be the difference of the variances, right? So it's going to be um, the difference of the variances over here is going to be just lambda squared times t minus s. And so this thing has, has the correct variance, basically, because the lambda squares cancel out. So the variance of this thing is the same as the variance b of t minus b of s has variance what? If I plug in a, if I replace this with b of t minus b of s, it's going to be a t minus s. That gives me the exact correct formulation of the variance. And then finally, for the continuity, if I dilate a continuous function, the dilation does not affect the continuity of the continuous function by the delta epsilon definition. So in other words, this is almost surely continuous as well. So all I need to check for this last, the scale invariance, is that the variance matched up in the correct way, because all of the, indep the independent increments 
increments are not affected, the independent increments are not affected by translating or scaling. If all the increments are independent, if I shift those things, it's still going to remain independent. And if I scale those things, I'm still of the same form, so I'm still going to be independent and stationary. So the stationary, the independent increments is preserved by this translation and by this particular scaling. And in further videos, we'll also see that there's a time inversion that holds for Brownian motion. That if I look at Brownian motion at reciprocal times in the right scale, I'll also have Brownian motion, which will help us and that, together with the law of strong, the strong law of large numbers, will help us understand the differentiability or the lack thereof at the origin, and also the fact that there's an infinite number of oscillations of Brownian motion near the origin that will help us understand the zero set of this of this process. Thank you very much.